Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here, still living. You're probably wondering, what's up with the dearth of episodes this year of The Monkey? When I started the CHP, I was pumping these podcasts out one a week. Then came the apologizing that, you know, now it's a fortnightly show, and now, more than 30 weeks into the year, only six podcasts to show for myself. Seven, including this special one today. Well, special for me, and special to all you guys out there who harangued me the past few years to cover this subject. For about a year now, I knew Scott Seligman was writing this book on the Tong Wars, and I wanted to wait till it got published so that I could use it as my official authoritative source to present this topic. It's called Tong Wars, the untold story of vice, money, and murder in New York's Chinatown. His new book on the Tong Wars is a pretty exhaustively researched book with all kinds of helpful lists, notes, and addenda to help you keep track of who was who and which original sources were cited for every minute detail written about those Diaz Violentos. In this episode, I'm not going to describe every fall of the meat cleaver in the book, but you'll have a pretty good idea uh, about the extent of the violence that went on over a period of about 30 years. The other story is how these these hoodlums, this very small minority of the total population of Chinese living in greater New York City, grabbed all the headlines. Newspaper reporters couldn't sensationalize and speculate enough on all the murders, the mayhem, the gambling dens, the drugs, the skin trade. And if you believed everything that was in the papers, you'd think every Chinese immigrant residing in the beautiful country was either a gang member or worse. The notoriety of the tongs and the brazenness of their actions did nothing to help portray the Chinese as the kind of immigrants that were welcome here. And in the lead up to our story, the Chinese couldn't have been made to feel less welcome than the years leading up to and during the Tong Wars. Our story takes place at the turn of the century, 1880s, 1890s. Over in China, those were the good old Qing Chao Monian. I've used that term before. The last years of the Qing dynasty. By 1900, the death watch had already begun for the Qing. Mao Zedong was seven years old, living in Shaoshan. China was weak. And because of this weakness, they stood by toothless as their citizens got kicked around and mistreated in the U.S. and other countries where the Chinese had emigrated. By 1900, the United States was already 18 years into the Chinese exclusion laws. Chinese, both recent immigrants and Chinese-American citizens alike, had been kicked around and disrespected since the 1870s. And now, after being the only group in American history singled out for this kind of exclusion from immigration and naturalization, they were doing their best to survive in a land that Well, seem not too happy to have them around. And these poor guys, you know, from places like Toisan, Hoiping, Sunwoi, and other villages dotted around the Pearl River Delta, they were just trying to make an honest buck. These were mostly men who owned or worked in the laundry biz or in restaurants, grocery stores, or, you know, engaged in every man's last resort, coolie labor. They worked hard, scrimped and saved, and fully intended to head back to the home country, you know, preferably in as triumphant a fashion possible, and live out their days in the village they came from. For some, this dream became reality. For some, it didn't. So life was a struggle for many, and other problems familiar to all immigrants, language usually most of all, you know, left them stranded. And if this wasn't bad enough, suddenly these wise guys began showing up in the major cities where Chinese lived and began shaking these poor guys down. Since the beginning of the gold rush in 1849, fraternal organizations had been created in San Francisco and later elsewhere that served these Chinese laborers and played a role similar to the headman, you know, in Chinese villages or clans. They adjudicated in times of conflict Uh, lent money, gave advice, helped as a liaison with the local authorities, made introductions, particularly after the year that lives in infamy, 1882, when the exclusion law was passed. The local Chinese in the U.S. were left with nowhere else to turn to except these organizations. But 
Somewhere along the way, things got a little messy. Today, we're focusing in on a geographic area, a little more than an acre of land. If you look at it on a map, you'll see this area is formed by a triangle with streets named Mott, Pell, and the Bowery. And then there's this small street inside the triangle that cuts from Pell to the Bowery called Doyer Street. And these four streets are where not all, but almost all the action takes place. These streets, of course, make up New York City's Chinatown neighborhood. In 1869, after the Golden Spike was hammered into the ground on May 10th, it spelled the end of one of the great engineering feats of the 19th century, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. This involved three construction projects that connected the Wild West with the existing railroad network out east. And these three projects are probably well known to many who studied U.S. history. They were the Western Pacific Railroad that ran from Oakland to Sacramento, the Central Pacific that ran from Sacramento to Promontory Summit, Utah, and the Union Pacific that took the railroad from Utah all the way to Council Bluffs, Iowa, located just across the Missouri River from Omaha, Nebraska. The bosses at the Central Pacific were the ones who primarily hired the Chinese laborers en masse at $31 to $35 a month. And the Chinese became known as the go-to guys for anything involving building tunnels and bridges. They had come by the thousands to America to escape the chaos of the Taiping Rebellion that ran from 1850 to 1864. But after the ceremonial pounding of the Golden Spike, it heralded the completion of the project. And the Chinese, who so famously built the railroads out west, had to go find a new job. The economy by then had seen better days. And as we discussed in the episodes covering the Chinese Exclusion Act in Wang Chin Fu, when times are hard, people need someone to blame. And politicians would point to the Chinese and say, that's our problem right over there. If not for him, we'd all be a lot better off. A familiar theme. Still works today, in fact, but, you know, not against the Chinese anymore. It was really bad out west. Politicians, you know, Dennis Kearney of the Working Man's Party most notably, for the sake of getting elected, were more than happy to fan the flames of racial prejudice against the Chinese. Dennis Kearney will always be remembered for the four politically incorrect words of his party slogan back then, quote, the Chinese must go. So go they did. Some just went back to China. But a lot of West Coast Chinese immigrants figured they'd seek out opportunities elsewhere and began heading eastward. The Chinese immigrants, you know, weren't popular out east either, but they didn't have to put up with half the violence and racism as their brethren living in the Golden State. Now, I've said this before, and I'll mention it again. In one way, the Chinese were just like any other immigrant group that first came to these shores. There was this painful gauntlet of societal disapproval that all immigrants had to first walk before they gained at least you know, a modicum of acceptance. Some immigrant groups found America to be such a wonderful and fantastic place and such a great land of opportunities that they secretly hoped that the matter of immigration could stop with them. They didn't want to share the bounty with anyone else if they, you know, didn't have to. So when these American citizens of German, Polish, Irish, or Italian descent got a load of the Chinese, they did not like what they saw. First of all, anyone with two brain cells knew what newly arrived immigrants meant as far as the cesspool of low-paying jobs in the neighborhood went. Without that white skin these other immigrants had, the Chinese couldn't blend in easy. They stood out. Those strange clothes, those shoes, the cues they wore, their peculiar habits in comparison to what was considered normal at the time. They were, they were sitting ducks, the Chinese were. No politician gave a hoot about them. The police made their life miserable. People vs. Hall, 1853, effectively made it legal for a white man to kill a Chinese and get away with it. So in times like this, the Chinese had to find ways to protect themselves and survive these toughest years of the whole history of the Chinese-American immigration experience. 
the Toysan guy, ironing shirts in a sweatshop laundry 18 hours a day, doesn't speak a word of English. If he ever got caught in a bind, he had to have somebody, anybody, some patron who could go to bat for him. Mott Street was 8,000 miles away from his village in Toysan. Who was he going to turn to in times of need? Now, I say it was better in New York for the Chinese than it was in San Francisco, you know, as far as the worst vitriol and racist attacks went. But there came to be this uh, genre of journalism that covered the world of the Chinese. It was more entertainment than news, and the kind of stuff they got away with back then you know, wouldn't hold muster today. The press had a black hand in creating this aura of industrialized scorn and disrespect heaped on the Chinese. This style of writing began in California, but found its way to all the major cities across the land, including, of course, the city of New York. You know, today, people from China come to L.A., pay cash for some mansion in Arcadia, and right away there's, there's people who can get them fully flanged in a day. Show them where the Costco is, where's Roland Heights, where to get this and that service, how to pay taxes, get a driver's license, everything. The 1860s version of that in New York Chinatown was a guy named Wu Gay. This was the name of his store, and his real name was probably Wong Ah Chong. He was the welcome wagon. He'd be the guy who would be at the train station or pier to greet the arriving Chinese and, you know, gave them all the most important survival tips. This man, Wu Gay, wasn't the leader of the New York Chinese community, but he was someone who uh, most people deferred to at the time. In 1873, the main character of our story arrived in the Big Apple. This was Wong Ah Ling, but he was known in the history books as Tom Lee. He had legally changed his name to Tom Lee, figuring that a name like Wong Ah Ling was a little bit too much for the Americanskis to get their mouth around. He came to this seedling of a Chinatown, a 24-year-old lad from somewhere in Guangzhou. He came from San Francisco and had already done the whole coolie thing. But Tom Lee had bigger plans. So did the organization that sent him out east. Tom Lee arrived in New York as an agent of sorts, sent by the six companies who at the time could be called the unofficial heads of San Francisco Chinatown. Later on, the six companies will become better known as the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. They had received a message from one of their people in New York who beseeched them to send out a man who could bring some semblance of order out of what was evolving inside the triangle of Mott, Pell, and the Bowery. Tom Lee had four main goals when he arrived in New York. They were to impose order and organize the Chinese already there, act as a bridge to the establishment, become filthy rich in the process, and start a family. He had already begun his citizenship process in St. Louis in 1876. He married a Caucasian woman named Minnie Rose Kaler, a big woman of German-Scottish stock, about 10 years his junior. He settled down at a place located at 20 Mott Street, next door to where Ping Seafood is today. After taking stock of the situation, Tom Lee began to quietly establish himself as the unofficial mayor of Chinatown. He knew how to work the crowd and had all the English skills necessary to converse freely with the natives. Little by little, Tom Lee began to establish himself, step forward to provide leadership at key moments. People began coming to him to settle disputes and preside over all kinds of ceremonies. He began to look out for his fellow Chinese, and they noticed what he was doing and increasingly deferred to him. By the end of 1878, he had definitely arrived. Back in Tom Lee's day, there was this well-known organization called the Society of St. Tammany. It was better known in American history as Tammany Hall. This was a very powerful Democrat-run machine that became synonymous with political corruption. They ran New York politics and were the power brokers behind anything that mattered. They had a lot of money, and they threw it around generously to keep themselves in office where they fed off the system for decades. Just like the Communist Party in China used these cadres to organize and control people down to the smallest levels of society, 
So did Tammany Hall. They used a network of precinct captains stationed in the individual neighborhoods to keep everyone organized and following the party line. Tammany Hall in its day, which straddles our story here, was the living personification of the well-oiled machine. Once Tom Lee figured out who they were and how the system worked, he was determined to reach out to these people. As a voting bloc, the Chinese weren't of much interest to guys like Tammany Hall. They didn't vote, and once the 1882 exclusion laws were passed, there was no chance for the Chinese to grow as a constituency. So Tom Lee couldn't deliver too many votes their way, but he did have something else of great interest to Tammany Hall, and that was money. He had lots of that. He knew he'd have to throw a lot of it around to get their attention and to establish relations with them. By 1880, Tom Lee had surpassed Wu Gei as the head man in Chinatown. And that year, he set up the Lun Yi Tong in Mandarin. That's the Lian Yi Tang. It was modeled after the Hongmen organization. The Hongmen were discussed in the Hong Kong Triad episode, CHP 72. They're sometimes called the Chinese Freemasons. It started off as an all-purpose fraternal organization that evolved into a secret society with, you know, initiation rites and everything. Tom Lee had managed to make a lot of money by the 1880s and owned properties at 2 and 4 Mott Street, where the Citibank is today. And the buildings in Chinatown were quietly being snapped up by Chinese buyers, one by one. Tom Lee was successful in his attempts to reach out to Tammany Hall politicians. He had thrown sufficient money around to get himself appointed as a deputy sheriff of New York County, the first Chinese to ever make it to a public office in that state. This didn't hurt his public stature in Chinatown. And as the days passed, he consolidated his position in the community. Things were generally peaceful and quiet until one day Tom Lee, trying to break up a fight across from the Lun Yi Tong office at 18 Mott, got beat up by a guy named Lee Sing. No way Tom Lee could back down and save face, so he took Lee Sing to court but lost. Thanks to his Tammany Hall friends, anyone who went up against Tom Lee in court invariably lost, no matter what the merits of their case. But not this time. And Tom Lee burned to get even. Before long, everybody who owned a gambling hall, an opium den, or house of ill repute in Chinatown was paying tribute money to Tom Lee. Tom Lee pocketed a piece of that, but a good portion of it went into the pockets of the police and politicians. And in return for all these payoffs, the authorities looked the other way with respect to all the vice in Chinatown. People were allowed to get high in the opium dens. They could buy lottery tickets, bet on Fantan, and Pai Gao to their heart's content. And since most all the males in Chinatown were single or had wives back in their home village... Prostitution rounded out the last of the big three vices. In 1883, Tom Lee set up an organization known as the Chinese Gamblers Union. It acted as a kind of benevolent society for everyone involved in the gambling business. The union acted as an unofficial regulatory body and came to the aid of its members whenever they ended up on the wrong side of the law. And because Tom Lee was in charge and because he was so well-connected to the courts and to law enforcement, anyone who attempted to cross the Gamblers' Union inevitably failed. In ten years, this Gamblers' Union will become known as the Onliang Tong. Same with the opium dens. As long as the drugs were confined to the Chinese only, no one made a big fuss. The only problem was that more than just the Chinese enjoyed partaking of drugs. And people from uptown also came to Chinatown to get high. You know, the cops didn't like that. The Chinese weren't the only immigrant groups operating gambling joints. There were over 2,000 of them going on at any given time in New York. Gambling generated a ton of money, and a lot of that cash got siphoned off to pay off the fuzz and the corrupt... Tammany Hall politicians who ran the city at the time. Tom Lee ran everything in Chinatown. And like anyone in his position, he had to fight off people who were trying to bring him down. In the decade of the 1890s, although he had to take his lumps every so often, he was still the king of Chinatown. Over the period of the last decade, Tom Lee had created a dynamic that put him 
at the critical crossroads between the downtrodden ordinary Chinese living or working in Chinatown and the city government and all its departments. Tom Lee knew how to use the gambling union and his entire network of relationships as well as his personal wealth to continually build up and consolidate his position. Yeah, since he had arrived in New York Chinatown, Tom Lee had worked hard, established himself, and certainly enriched himself. But he also helped out a lot of the residents in and around Chinatown. He had lined the pockets of a lot of politicians and was most brazen in how he did it sometimes. The problem with people like Tom Lee is that once in a while some Dudley Do-Right came along who wouldn't play along with the system, or even worse, who launched some high-profile crusade to discredit the system and bring down everything he had built. Something else Tom Lee had to stress out over was when someone would try to muscle in on the action. That's what happened here. In the mid-1880s, an outfit called the Hipsing Tong emerged as one of the top traffickers in human cargo. After 1882, the door was slammed shut for any Chinese laborer trying to make it to the USA. That left the option of getting smuggled into the country and then going to work in any number of legal or illegal businesses. A tong is just a name for some organization, you know, like a chamber or society. These gangsters, like Tom Lee, went and hijacked this Chinese character and soiled it with all kinds of negative connotations. The Hipsing Tong, or in Mandarin, the Xiesheng Tang, started off in San Francisco. They made their way east to New York to set up a chapter out there and, of course, muscle in on Tom Lee's action. So in the late 1880s, the Hip Sings had men on the ground checking out the scene, trying to get the lay of the land. They saw that, indeed, Tom Lee ruled the roost with an iron fist. His right hands were his nephew, Lee Toy, Lee Kwan Chong, a.k.a. Charlie Boston, and a guy named Yut Singh. They represented the primary bridge between everything that went down in Chinatown and the political establishment. When the Hip Sings started to stake out their corner of this very tiny area, it was inevitable that there would be sparks flying between themselves and Tom Lee's Lun Yi Tong. The Lun Yi were concentrated on Mott Street, and the Hip Sings over on Pell. So now with the Hip Sings showing up and making themselves right at home, they established a bad reputation for being a rough lot. Hitmen, violent, not to be taken lightly. But they were trying to assert themselves, and Tom Lee had to work overtime to use all his connections in law enforcement to slow them down and keep them at bay. It didn't take long before the hip sings began running their own joints on Pell Street. In November 1893, Tom Lee changed the name of the Gamblers' Union to the On Leong Tong, or An Liang Tang in Mandarin. And with that, you now had the two main Tongs who are immortalized in the four Tong Wars of New York Chinatown, the On Liang and the Hip Sing. There will be another Tong, but we'll get to them next episode. These two rivals began screwing with each other at once. A competition began to evolve between the joints on Pell, run by the Hip Sings, and those on Mat, run by the On Liangs. The Hip Sings, being the newcomers, needed time to establish themselves. The cops they tried to pay off were already long on Tom Lee's payroll. He had cultivated these relationships over years, and it wasn't so easy for the Hip Sings to win the loyalties of the corrupt police. A familiar way of screwing with each other began to evolve. This basically involved a back-and-forth routine of snitching on each other. The On Leongs would inform the cops of some fantan parlor being run at some address on Pell, and the Hip Sings would do the same thing. So cops were constantly raiding these gambling joints, but you know, with the law on their side, the On Leongs were able to stay one step ahead of the Hip Sings. It was only a matter of time before the good old days in Chinatown were threatened. This came in the form of two crusaders who... In the 1890s, we were determined to put an end to all the gambling, drugs, and prostitution in Chinatown. They were Dr. Charles H. Parkhurst and a respected attorney named Frank Moss. Tom Lee and the On Leongs are really going to come to hate those guys. 
Frank Moss used the Parkhurst soapbox to blab to the press about the venality of Chinatown and the extent of how corrupt the local law enforcement was in keeping the state of affairs alive. Even though the corruption was the worst kept secret in Manhattan, the less said about it, the better. Vice, corrupt politicians, police on the take. It was a story the journalists just couldn't resist. The crusade undertaken by these Social reformers were not directed solely at the criminal organizations operating in Chinatown. The big prize was Tammany Hall itself. Charles Parkhurst was an ordained clergyman who used his pulpit in the church to lambast Tammany Hall and all that was corrupt about them. He had been put in charge of the New York Society for the Prevention of Crime and was determined to breathe some life into this largely ineffective organization. This society began constantly breathing down the neck of Tammany Hall and all the corrupt policemen and politicians downstream. He was quite effective in shining a spotlight on the extent of the cooperation between criminals, politicians, and law enforcement. Parkhurst knew how to utilize the press and how to give a good speech. As long as the Democrats of Tammany Hall stayed in power... They were able to keep these detractors like Parkhurst and Frank Moss at bay. But you know how it is. You can't stay in power forever. And in 1894, the Dems were out and the GOP was in. And with that, the New York State Legislature turned its eyes on the problem. And this is how the Lexo Committee got started. Clarence Lexo was the state senator put in charge of this committee that investigated all these allegations of corruption. Parkhurst had done a good job exposing the worst of the corruption going on under the Tammany Hall umbrella. From 1894 to 1895, investigations were held, and the Parkhursts, as they came to be called, presented as their star witness a man named Wong Get. Wong, a Hipsing member, was the darling of Frank Moss. He spoke English, exhibited himself as a man of Christian values, and was a convincing witness. He spilled every bean there was but what Tom Lee and his On Leong Tong were up to in Chinatown. He went into all the juicy details, as only an insider could, about how the whole world of vice in Chinatown was controlled by Tom Lee from his On Leong headquarters on Mott Street. He explained how anyone who wanted to operate a fantan parlor had to pay the On Leong for protection. There wasn't a single business in Chinatown that didn't have Tom Lee's finger in that pie. That was interesting enough. But when Wong Get started going into details about all the payoffs to the cops, eh, you could imagine how the papers couldn't wait to print that testimony. And the thing was, Frank Moss and the Parkhurst were using Wong Get to expose the corruption in the city government, and Wong Get was using them to bring Tom Lee and the On Leongs down. And by the time Frank Moss was finished with Wong Get, Nothing was left to the imagination as far as the extent of the police corruption. It made for sensational reading. Wong Get had a personal grudge to settle with the On Leongs. Not only had his joint been smashed up by them, he himself had suffered a physical beating at the hands of Tom Lee's nephew, Lee Toy. He was sure getting his revenge now, testifying before the Lexo Committee. So by the clever manipulation of all the main characters in the employ of the New York City government, from judges down to the cop walk and the beat, the hip sings duped everyone, at least for a while, that they were merely interested with cleaning up Chinatown and making it a nice place to live and visit. Because of all this cooperation he gave to the Lexo Committee, Wong Get did wonders to position the hip sings as the good guys in Chinatown. They were even called the Chinese Parkers. But most of all, he was able to paint Tom Lee and the organization he ran as the bad guys. And the reformers had what they wanted. Testimony that showed the whole police department down to the last precinct were in the pockets of the brazenly corrupt Tammany Hall political machine who, in turn, got fat on payoffs from the On Leongs. Even the press was calling the hip sings, quote, the respectable Orientals. So the On Leong Tong took a big hit. Soon the press was printing stories that suggested Tom Lee eh, wasn't what he used to be and his power was waning. The hip sings manipulated the press and the public servants so that all the heat 
was put on Tom Lee. But Tom Lee wasn't taking this lying down, and he still had a few connections of his own and was able to get the word out. The hip sings weren't as lily white as everyone was making them out to be. And that wasn't no lie. They engaged in the same illegal businesses as the Onleongs and knew how to shake people down like the best of them. And one thing about the hip sings versus the Onleongs, when Tom Lee extorted some local business for protection, some of that money went up the food chain to the politicians who looked after him. In the case of the Hip Singhs, since theoretically they were the reformers of Chinatown and didn't engage in crime, they didn't have to pay anyone off. So that was one thing that probably didn't sit too well with Tom Lee. In a way, he was carrying the Hip Singhs on his back as far as, you know, keeping the nose of the police out of their illicit affairs. Well, 1895, the Lexo Committee had the desired effect, and Tammany Hall was voted out of office, and the Republicans were in. As soon as that state of affairs was official, they began cleaning up the city. And there was this new guy appointed as commissioner of police. He was a man of great ambitions and who defined the term larger than life. He was Teddy Roosevelt, later on our 26th president. He was near the beginning of his political career, so he was out to prove something. So, T.R. got his mop and bucket and started cleaning up the streets and wiping away as much of the patronage system as he could. He made a nice, big dent. But in two years, a slot opened up in Washington for him as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So, he left the scene, but had made quite an impact during the time he was there. So now, with this new dynamic... It was a time of non-stop jostling for position in Chinatown. For the rest of the 1890s, both sides used their proxies in the government to get the better of each other. And the white establishment always thought they knew what was going on, but they were just led around by the nose all the time. Back and forth, the Anleongs and the Hip Sings snitched on each other, you know, whispering about this fantan parlor or that opium den or, you know, whatever. Then the place would get raided and shut down. And in the current environment, often there wasn't anyone to pay off. Not everyone was taking bribes. Now there was this mishmash of clean and dirty cops walking the Chinatown beat. Late in 1896, the Hip Sings incorporated and became an official organization, registered with the government and all. There were 300 members to start, and not to be outdone by their rivals, the Onleongs formed their own official group, February 1897, with the innocuous-sounding name of the China Merchants Association. They were located at 14 Mott Street, where the Aji Sen Ramen place is today. I think it's still there. The president of the China Merchants Association was, of course, Tom Lee, with Charlie Boston, Lee Loy, and Ju Gong rounding out the other executive positions. I'm sure declaring their legitimacy through the founding of these apparently respectable institutions fooled everyone. 1897, the Hip Sings were still putting on the same show. They snitched on the Onleongs mercilessly and kept up this image that, you know, they were the good guys trying to clean up Chinatown. But actually, by this time, despite their best efforts, their veneer of respectability had worn thin to the point of transparency. You see, there was a newcomer who came to town. He was a Hip Sing and didn't take long for this San Francisco import to grab this criminal organization by the throat and take them over. He carved a line in the cement that made Pell Street the exclusive domain of the Hip Sings. He didn't look like much. Five foot six, 125 pounds, movie star looks, fedora hat. His name in Mandarin was Maida, but this guy probably didn't even speak Mandarin. His surname was pronounced Muck in uh, Cantonese. De, which ironically means morality or, or, or virtue, is pronounced duck. Maybe you've heard of him before, maybe not. Mak duck. This guy was a bad seed. As soon as he made himself comfortable and started laying his chess pieces on the board, the relative calm in Chinatown is going to be shaken for three decades. Four wars will be fought and there will be more slicing and dicing going on. Even my friend Stephen Wong will be shocked. So now, Mock Duck 
had made his grand entrance, and the tit-for-tat snitching on each other and the occasional physical beating began to change into something a little more violent. And to throw some gasoline on this small fire, the Republicans were voted out in 1898, and the Dems were back in. This meant Tammany Hall was back, baby. Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Staten Island were all joined together that year into one single greater New York. And the new mayor of these newly joined five boroughs was the guy the I-678 was named after, Robert Anderson Van Wick. He was a Tammany Hall guy. So the PR wars continued with both sides pointing at each other, saying the other guy's kettle was blacker than theirs. All kinds of stunts were being pulled, always involving tipping off the police, which in turn caused some sort of inconvenience and economic loss to the respective tongs. By now, no one viewed the hip sings as these great Chinatown reformers. They were by now knee-deep in all the big three, prostitution, gambling, and drugs, with a little murder for hire on the side. And so it was, at the turn of the century, the spigots got turned on. Now the blood was about to start flowing. The year 1900 brought even more bad news to the beleaguered Chinese community in New York and across the U.S. In June of that year, over in China, the Empress Dowager had given the boxers her stamp of approval and the atrocities that were committed against missionaries and other foreigners in China were well publicized and naturally didn't reflect well on the Chinese. The Chinese in America didn't have anything to do with these radical extremists in China and their boxer rebellion. But that didn't mean they got off the hook, and it certainly didn't do much to help garner sympathy from lawmakers and the Chinese crusade to fight against the exclusion laws. A gentleman named Long Qin became the Archduke Ferdinand of the Tong Wars when he became the first to get whacked in a daring hit carried out by an Onliang soldier, or highbinder as they came to be known. This happened in the hallway of a building located on 9 Pell Street, yeah, where Zhou Shanghai is, Lu Ming Chun. Long Qin was a hip sing member. And the way it's going to work is no death under any circumstances could be left unavenged. Face was at stake here. If someone killed one of your guys and you didn't do anything about it, you were considered weak. No face. The hip sings were going to retaliate, and we'll see next episode what happens when both sides go to the mattresses. I hope you'll come back. Again, the book is called Tong Wars, the untold story of vice, money, and murder in New York's Chinatown. That is Hot Off the Press from Viking Books. The author is Mr. Scott Seligman. I'll have a link to his Amazon page where you can get this book and some of the other things he's done. You all remember the unforgettable, for more reasons than one, uh, episode CHP 136 on Wong Fu. That was based on Scott's book, The First Chinese American. Alec Ash, yes, the same guy written up the other day in the New York Times, he has a new book out, Wish Lanterns, Young Lives in New China, a nice, gripping account of young Chinese as they come of age in today's more complex than ever, People's Republic of China. You get some real nice insight that you won't get elsewhere. Alec Ash, Wish Lanterns, Young Lives in New China, also recommended on the Seneca podcast, so you know it must be pretty good. Seneca is now found on the new Sup China platform. SupChina.com and the app, which I dutifully downloaded. China in two minutes a day, every day without fail, 5.30 p.m. L.A. time, I get the top news and analysis delivered right to my inbox. SupChina's whole team will help you keep your finger on the daily pulse in China, and it allows me to get all the nutrition and vitamins I need to satisfy my China media diet. Kaiser, Jeremy, David, and Ada Shun, names you've all surely come to know and trust. SupChina.com, the new home of the Seneca Podcast. Go check it out. Download the app. That's it for this time. Heading to Shanghai and Hong Kong for a week of whatever happens. As soon as I get back, you can rest assured I'll be fast at work on the next episode. Until then... This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off in the middle of a bone-dry heat wave here in the City of Angels, going up to 108 today, maybe higher.
Thanks for listening, and please consider coming back next time for what will assuredly be a nice, bloody episode of the China History Podcast. Take care, everyone.